from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 110, recorded live Tuesday, April 22nd, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Rustin and Mike from the Microsoft Research Group about the Spec Sharp programming language. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm sitting here at the Alt.net conference in Seattle, Washington, with Rustin and Mike from the Microsoft Research Group, working on a product called Spec Sharp that they've just demoed to the Alt.net crowd here. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for sitting down with me today. Thanks for having us. So, Spec Sharp, it says Sharp, that must mean it has something to do with C Sharp, possibly the .NET framework. What does Spec Sharp do? Spec Sharp is a superset of C Sharp, of the C Sharp language, um, and it adds to the language specifications, which is where the language gets its name. Um, the specifications are contracts like pre and post conditions, and we also enhance the type system with uh, non-null types, for example. And with those contracts, you can you can record your design decisions in the in the program text, and uh, and have them uh, be checked by by various tools. So you are a superset of C Sharp. So you're saying that here are some keywords and some things that are not in C Sharp that we've added. You've enhanced the language itself. That's correct. So the um, so we add a few keywords, a few new constructs here and there. Are you your own compiler or are you a post compiler? We're a uh, full fledged compiler, so it compi- it's not a source to source transformation. It takes the uh, surface syntax and compiles it all the way down to IL and creates uh, valid .NET assemblies just as the VB compiler or the C-sharp compiler do. Mm-hmm. So did you have to recreate work that was already done by the C-sharp compiler? Yes, because it's completely independent. So, I mean, it's, it does a full, you know, parsing uh, and, and code generation, and it's uh, the code base is absolutely separate from the C-sharp compiler. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it was a good thing for quickly getting a... Uh, the compiler up and running. Mm-hmm. It was uh, a bad thing in the sense that now we are a superset of C sharp two o and not a superset of C sharp three o. I see. But of course, the intent is to make this something that's useful for everyone because you're trying to take the notion of a specification and add it to all .NET languages. That's right. So one of the things we're looking at now is a non-language based solution, and we use Spec Sharp as a way to. Uh, sort of paint a picture of the future of what it could look like if a language was to fully embrace the idea of design by contract and make specifications a first-class citizen. Uh, uh, but we're also working on, we've designed SpecSharp in a way that has made it possible to peel off layers and potentially get those layers implemented in uh, all .NET languages. Ah. So you've added a number of keywords to C Sharp in order to allow this design by contract uh, concept. What are some of the keywords, and uh, ex- explain how I would decorate one of my methods with these keywords. Um, the first one is um, th- that one runs across is not the keyword at all, but just another symbol, which is the exclamation point, the bang. Uh, so the if bang. you okay. right, if you write a reference type like T or string or object, and you follow it by bang, uh, making it string bang or object bang, T bang, uh, what you're saying is that that type is a type that holds a reference that is not null. And that's something that that uh, you tend to use all over. So in in the Spec Sharp type system, we allow programs to use non-null types, and and then the the type system, the compiler, will will make sure that just as as you use types elsewhere in the program, that you don't give a boolean when a, a string is expected. Uh, here, it also does that for for non-null entities. So this is a kind of an assertion where I'm de- I'm making a declaration that the type T shall never be null. That's correct. That is uh, a kind of assertion like that. Uh, or you, some people even call that a, a contract as well. Okay. So I'm strengthening, I'm, I'm constraining the system such that uh, the system cannot get into a state which is not what I want. That's correct. And for the, for the non-null types themselves, we also support a, a mode where you switch the defaults where, where the, the types 
uh, stand for non-null types. And if you want the, the nullable versions, you do like you do with value types today in, in C sharp, which is to add a question mark afterwards. Right. Uh, so people are familiar with being able to say something like int question mark, where suddenly a value type, which for many years has not been nullable, it becomes nullable. Uh, uh, right, exactly. And I can do the, the, the inverse now with, uh, you know, class person, which would initially start out null if I said person p equals null. And now if I said, uh, if person bang, I can't assign null to it. That's it will correct. never be null within the scope of the project. Exactly. Right. So that's the, that's the simplest keyboard or, uh, thing that we're adding to, to the language. Simplest, mm-hmm. at least, uh, syntactically. Then, um, the other things that you see next are, uh, pre con- preconditions and post conditions, and they are written with the with the requires and ensures keywords, which follow the signature of the method. So you would write uh, void m and give the parameters and the and a close parenthesis, and then you would say requires, and you would give a, a boolean condition um, that says what under which conditions the method is allowed to be called. Okay, so trying to visualize this, remembering that we've got people commuting in an audio world and we don't have any video to show them, uh, I've created a method that takes a string and an integer, and before the opening curly brace, but after the method signature, I'm going to say that it is the case that this string and this integer meet these conditions if one is going to be allowed to call this method. Right. For example, you might say that the, that the integer is less than the length of the string, um, as an example. Interesting. So when I express a method, uh, a contract right now, the extent of that method contract is that it takes these types, and I can expand that contract by adding overloads, and uh, a lot of people have asked for things like optional parameters in C-sharp, but you're, you're tightening the noose, as it were, and saying that uh, not only might I say that this string must be this length, or that this integer must be below this value, but that they can interrelate to each other. That's correct. So the so what we do with with types, one typically just expresses something about each variable independently. And with the contracts like pre and post conditions, you can very very easily and naturally uh, constrain uh, several variables at one time. Now the uh, what about the result that would be coming back? Because uh, you made the comment of void m, but let's say that I take a string and an integer, but I'm going to be returning some value, another string perhaps. Spec Sharp has added uh, context sensitive. Uh, context-dependent keyword result, and a, the, that uh, keyword can appear in a post condition, an ensures clause, which guarantees to callers of the method uh, some condition involving the return value. And so it stands for the value that's being returned from the method in the condition. Ah, so just like when I'm creating a property and I'm doing a property setter and I have this keyword called value that is context-specific returning to the value that's coming in to the setter, this is a keyword that refers to what's exiting. Exactly. Now, I could make post conditions and preconditions now by putting in a debug.assert at the beginning or a debug.assert at the, at the, as I exit, but uh, why would this be more desirable? To, to use spec sharp for that, it's particularly on the exit case. Right. So the the crucial difference is that uh, if you use debug dot assert inside of your method body, it is something that is visible to you and to the program only internally inside of that method. Callers of that method are not able to take advantage of the fact that you happen to have put those uh, uh, conditions on the code. If you use spec sharp, then the contracts are visible to all callers of the method. And the spec sharp tools can be applied to those callers to guarantee that the caller will not violate the preconditions of the method being called and can enjoy the benefits of what the post condition guarantees them. For instance, if you call string.concat, there's no, there's not necessarily a guarantee that what comes back is non-null. But if concat had a post condition which said the result is non-null, then you would know that you can freely dereference the result that comes back from that method without having to do a runtime check to make sure that it was non-null. To add to that, as an as an analogy, you might consider making all of your methods take object as parameters, and that is that, that the type of all of them would be object, and inside of your method you would immediately cast them to an integer or a string or whatever it is that you want. But by instead making them part of the method signature, you're telling callers that that's what you expect. Um, in a similar way, by instead of using debug.dessert inside of your method body, you put pre and post conditions on the method, you're telling something to, the, to your caller. 
That is a really interesting way to put it. Just by having the type uh, signature there, you are constraining that contract. I could certainly have an, uh, a method that took an array of object of indeterminate length and where each object is of indeterminate type. And unfortunately, I've seen method signatures like that in the wild that return then an array of objects. And I would have really no way of knowing other than this is a method called M. And I'm constraining that by adding something as simple as method uh, adding types. So we continue to tighten things up. So we're saying um, that the domain of what this method uh, is responsible for is, is smaller and smaller and smaller. Does that make it easier to test? That that makes first of all it makes the requirements clear what what is expected of the caller and what is expected of the implementation. But it also means that when you when you analyze your uh, the implementation, which you could do either by testing, mm -hmm. um, which is how it's frequently done, um, or uh, or by some other tools like, for example, our static verifier, then we only need to consider those uh, input states that satisfy those uh, those preconditioned constraints. So I'm hearing both you have runtime checking, which would be the equivalent of what I was saying of doing a debug.assert. So that's happening at, at runtime. But this, this, the importance of this being static, you have tightened up the message signature such that callers of that method signature are, are aware of that contract. Right. We, we want to support dynamic checking because it's an easy way to get into the using contracts. Uh, one adds a little bit of code, just like you would add a debug.assert somewhere, and it's going to check some condition when you're, mm -hmm. when you're running it. And at the same time, you're recording your design decisions in the code. But we want to go a step further. And uh, so in our, in our research, we've spent uh, a good bit of effort on trying to statically verify these things. What we do there is we, uh, technologically, is we take the program and convert it into a mathematical formula, a, a very large mathematical formula. Um, but it's um, typically mathematically shallow, uh, meaning we're not trying to prove uh, Fermat's less, last conjecture or something like that. Um, so what we do, but there are lots and lots of details to check. So we pass that to an automatic theorem prover, mm -hmm. and the uh, which then analyzes the mathematical formula uh, to see if it's a valid logical formula. And if it is, that means that the program is correct. If it isn't, the, the theorem prover will return to us some mathematical counterexample that shows that it's not a mathematically um, valid formula. And then we um, have kept enough information so we can take that mathematical counterexample and bring it back into an error message that the that the programmer, the .NET programmer, will understand. Uh, things like, uh, here you're calling a method and you don't satisfy the precondition, or here you're trying to um, index an array outside its bounds. Mm -hmm. Now, previously on this podcast, I'd spoken to um, Peli Dialu and Nikolai about their product, PEX, uh, and they had spoken of the way that they had layered it such that they could peel off pieces, and they spoke of a solver that they pass information into. Is this, in fact, the same component? In fact, it is the, the same one. The, uh, the particular theorem prover is called Z3, and it's also developed at Microsoft Research. Interesting. So th th there's a relationship between the kinds of things that PEX is trying to solve, which is to prove that code will run uh, as it is written and that it will it, it appropriately meets the spec, and, and what you guys are trying to do. Absolutely. All um, I would say all formal tools like PEX and Spec Sharp function by uh, treating a program as a mathematical object, mm -hmm. uh, which it is because it's a set of formal symbols which have to be that way so that the computer can understand it and execute the program. Uh, and then you make progress by using different mathematical theories to uh, analyze properties of that program. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of talk has been made lately of, of F-sharp and the notion of a functional language being more easily mathematically provable by its very nature. One can say that this is uh, proven to work thusly. Uh, are we trying to take C-sharp in that same kind of a direction, or would it be more appropriate to simply use a language that was provable by its nature? Um, if one looks at the at the research that has been done for program verification, most of it has been done for imperative programs, uh, not so much for the functional languages, which is which is unfortunate. And and we, because the functional languages start off with something that is, uh, well, as you perhaps thought of it as more correct. That is, it's it's more rigorous in in some in some ways. You know more things about the things in in the program, uh, but there's still many different uh, many difficult issues in in trying to apply program verification even to. Uh, functional programs. But what we're trying to do from the SpecSharp perspective is we find many places where where it 
where one would like to specify that a method has no side effects. Uh, and then we give the opportunity to say that it is a pure method. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to say that the class uh, is something that uh, once its instances are constructed, they don't change. Uh, you can mark that class to be immutable. And those things do help in the, in the static verification of the programs. And in addition, the annotations that we have give uh, additional documentation to the program, of course. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm going to just take a very brief moment, and we're going to thank our sponsors, and we'll come right back. Hi, it's Scott here from another place in time. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I apologize for interrupting it, but I wanted to let you know that assembling a podcast like this every week isn't free. Certainly the bandwidth bill crushes us every month, so I want to let you know that this show is sponsored by Telerik. They make the show possible, and they make some pretty cool products as well. For example, if you're trying to build a Web 2.0 Ajaxy application, trying to use the Web 1.0 components, it's kind of difficult you got to get the next-gen stuff if you want to build the next-gen websites, and that's exactly what the folks at Telerik have got in their new upcoming product, which is codenamed Rad Controls Prometheus. It's a big pack of web controls built entirely on top of the Microsoft ASP.NET Ajax stuff that you already understand. It's going to give you a lot of performance and interactivity on your next project. They mirror the ASP.NET Ajax API, so the development's really straightforward. Client scripts are shared. Loading time is pretty fast. You set a couple of properties. You can even bind to web services for a really efficient operation. The new RAD editor for ASP.NET AJAX loads up to four times faster than before, and the RAD grid will do thousands of records in milliseconds. But, of course, it's, it's better to try these things for yourself, so you can visit Telerik.com slash ASP.NET AJAX and download a trial. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll get right back to the show. So th this notion of, of side effects in an object changing when it maybe shouldn't change or entering a state in which it is inappropriate, uh, I saw that you had a keyword uh, for, for invariant. Correct. When people think of contracts, they typically first think of pre and post conditions, but a very important uh, aspect of a, of a contract is also the, the invariant, which states properties that are, that you intend to hold of the status, steady state of the, of, uh, of a data structure. Mm -hmm. That is, the invariant says what the, um, what the internal consistency of your data structures are. Um, to verify a program statically, you need to have invariants. And invariants are, are difficult to deal with because they are not entirely invariant. They do change. That is, there are some points in your program where, where the invariants do not hold. And that has probably been uh, one of the, the largest scientific contributions that we've done in the SpecSharp research project uh, to, to try to figure out and, and wrestle with when, when do invariants hold and what do we do when they, when they don't hold uh, so that other parts of the program don't rely on them holding at that point. Uh, so we do we, we do allow invariants. The invariants are checked at the end of the constructor, and we also, uh, from the runtime perspective, we only check them at the end of of exposed statements. Uh, so we have an exposed statement in SpecSharp, which um, which is like a block of code. It looks it, a bit like a, a lock statement in concurrent code, and it says that within the exposed statement, you're allowed to to modify the, the variables, the invariant might not hold throughout that, but at the end of the exposed block, we check that the invariant holds oh, again. Oh, interesting. So statically, in the static verifier, we also check the invariants at those points. Uh, but in addition, if you modify state outside of an exposed block, we check that that every assignment that you do outside an exposed expose block will indeed maintain the invariants. Okay, so t just to make sure I'm hearing correctly, you, the word you're using is expose, E-X-P-O-S-E. That's correct. So for, for the, for the moment that I, for the time that I am in that block, I am exposed. I am in states that may very well be inappropriate, but I'm calling it out explicitly and saying that by the time I leave, I best be back in my appropriate state. That's correct. Interesting. I really like the, the, the words that you, you've chosen. I, I, I find that when I'm, you know, in object oriented programming, certainly naming is everything. And if you can name it appropriately, uh, and that name feels correct, it feels natural that it will uh it'll just allow you to to use it in a comfortable way and i see that you've got assume requires ensures expose they're all words of similar length and they all feel that they're kind of from the same family and it seems like such a natural uh extension to the language mm -hmm. thank you um if keywords are important and uh, sometimes we wrestle with them and, and wish we had better ones but the uh, but that's our our um part of the, our, our current set so fundamental to what SpecSharp is trying to accomplish is this notion of really uh, encouraging design by contract. And from my point of view, the, the most obvious contract that we have available to us in, in C Sharp is this notion of an interface. That's a very high level construct that I can say, I want you to con be constrained to this interface, to inter uh, implement this interface. 
but that's just a series of methods that uh, take certain uh, certain parameters of certain types. Can I apply these kinds of spec sharp constructs to an interface to say not only do I want you to look like this, but I wish that you behave like this? Exactly. Spec sharp allows all of the same constructs we've been talking about at the method level on interface methods as well. And it's precisely to give interfaces behavioral descriptions that then every implementation is obligated to live up to. Uh, and it allows the promise of, of, of component programming where the only thing you know about a component is its interface to uh, have a semantic basis as well as just knowing that you've conformed to the method signatures. Yes, in retrospect, looking at an interface and saying that syntactically this is anywhere near appropriate of what I need to get my job done when the semantics are really uh, transmitted out of band, where out of band might be a Word document, which is a completely inappropriate way for to pass semantics for an interface. But you're saying I can actually impose this on things that have yet to be written. That seems the kind of miraculous. That seems kind of creepy almost. You're saying that uh, someone can come in totally later and implement that interface, and you're going to walk up back up to the interface and and see and con- and confirm that I am conforming to the the requirements to the specification as long as that eventual implementation is written in spec sharp mm-hmm. then yes the spec sharp compiler will make sure that that implementation conforms to all of the requirements that the interface specifications uh spell out in addition because spec sharp is an object oriented language the same holds true for subtypes and that's crucial in object oriented programming because if your the static type of a parameter is a type T, when you receive that type at runtime, it could be a subtype of T. It doesn't necessarily have to be a T itself. And so contracts in virtual methods are also binding upon all overrides of those methods. And that's the way you can guarantee the robustness of a system that you write the system today and it's robust against future evolution, uh, or at least more robust against future evolution because... Uh, you know that whatever the eventual subtype is, it will conform to the contract that you know about the static type. And this applies to even abstract base classes, which is another kind of an interface. Yes, exactly. The same exact details apply to abstract base classes. So so what about exceptions? Now I'm starting to feel like there's something like checked exceptions in, in Java, which people have always asked for when it comes to C-sharp. They're saying, where are my checked exceptions? Maybe tell us what checked exceptions are for our listeners who may not be familiar with that, that technology. Checked exceptions are ones that the that the compiler will look at how they can flow in the in the program, uh, so that you can you can make sure that there is some handler for for the checked exceptions. So it's an actually a way of enforcing. I'm going to call method foo, and internally somewhere it could throw an argument null exception. But the, well, currently in C sharp, there's no way for me to know that, and there's also no way to force the caller of foo to have a try catch block. That's exactly right. So the, if you want to, if you want to track that in the compiler and force the, the caller to either catch it or admit itself that it might let one of those exceptions through, then you would use a, a checked exception. Now, checked exceptions are, uh, there are certain kinds of conditions in your program where you really would like to use a checked exception. An example might be a socket closed, uh, exception where the programmer really needs to be aware of the possibility that the, that the socket might close. But you don't want to check it on, on every call. That is, you don't want a, a return code from every call and have to, to check that on right. every call. The argument against checked exceptions is that suddenly it litters my system with try-catch blocks or explicit calling out that I don't care that that's going to throw an exception. That's right. And in, in, in the cases where checked exceptions are appropriate, you would have a block of code that, that operates on, on some object uh, or objects, and then you would have a, a catch block at the end. And in those cases, the programmer really would like to know that... Um, that the exception is not missed, and that's what checked exceptions give you. Now, if you decide then to to let such an exception rip through, then then you have to admit to that, and then it's the 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 next caller in line that that gets to to deal with it. But this is different from uh, the example you gave uh, a minute ago was the uh, null exception, null um, pointer exception, which we consider to not be one of these uh, checked exceptions because it's not something that that a caller can reasonably do something with. That is, if you get one of those exceptions or or an out-of-memory exception, uh, sometimes you can you can recover from that or or a CLR internal error exception or something like that. There's those things could happen uh, and if if they occur, 
there's something disastrous that has happened in your program and you don't really expect to catch them except maybe at the at the backstop and in, in your main program. So there's different classes of exceptions. There's ones that I can do something about and there's ones that are truly exceptional, which it would be really not appropriate to call out explicitly. Correct. And that's why we give you the uh, the possibility to to make checked exceptions for when you want those and and leave the other ones as unchecked ones. And the and we um we can then do more tracking in the compiler of the, of the checked ones. So if I had a giant library, maybe even a base class library, like the BCL, full of thousands and thousands and thousands of methods that I would want to be able to call, uh, now that I've got the suspect sharp mindset, I would really say, oh, well, gosh, I hope that uh, the base class library, the .NET framework, system.star, was you know, instrumented with all of this good information. But that's an example of a huge chunk of C-sharp code, not spec-sharp code. And certainly I don't think that they're going to convert that to spec-sharp anytime soon. How do I get the benefits of spec-sharp when I don't have uh, a spec-sharp library? We have created a set of what we call out-of-band contracts for the entire base class library. Spec-sharp compiler can be run in a special mode where it will compile a file that contains no code but only the contracts and marks the resulting assembly such that the rest of the SpecSharp tools look glue together the original runtime assembly, such as MS Corelib, and the out-of-band contract for MS Corelib so that it looks inside the tool as if uh, the contracts had been there from the beginning. Now, in, in one sense, that's a lie because the contracts weren't there and so we created these contracts. We think they're reasonable. We think they're accurate. But it would be so much better if the uh, actual library itself came with its own contracts mm-hmm. that were guaranteed by having been written in the code in the first place. And we are, uh, you know, have been exploring for several years now with different product groups in Microsoft to try to uh, to make progress on that front and be able to provide a mechanism where the library providers will provide their own form of the library of the contracts interesting we have out of band documentation we have pdb files and then we could potentially have these contract files certainly it would be ideal if this were built into the language so it seems to me like uh i would want to pre- start pressuring anders the inventor of c sharp and uh, maybe the listeners would want to know what's the best way they can get c sharp uh, spec sharp built in you guys are microsoft research right you're not a product group you're doing this to push the the concept forward but uh, I assume you've met with Anders and you've told him about this several times. Uh, but he's got a lot on his plate. How can the listeners get involved? How can we get people to uh, to force Anders to listen at this great idea and get this built into C Sharp? Uh, well, every time we've talked to Anders, he's been quite supportive of uh, both the goals of the SpecSharp project and uh, the things we've been able to accomplish, the tools we've produced. Uh, he has uh, indicated that that. The important thing is to know that there's users out there that want it and that uh, can take advantage of it. And so I would say f- for any listener who's interested, they should download SpecSharp, which is publicly available for free from the Microsoft Research uh, website, and uh, you know use it and see if it's useful for their code, mm-hmm. and uh, then make noise about it. May either send email or post. You know, on blogs or uh, yeah, present tell their user friends. groups, exactly whatever it takes. Absolutely. So, in, in conclusion, here I want to make sure I understand the scope of this because it's not just runtime type checking. There's this fundamental notion of being able to statically prove that this is is correct. Uh, when I saw your demo earlier, I got I got to see little green squigglies, and I had uh, we, we've seen squigglies before in in Visual Studio, uh, red squigglies that I usually com- uh, compare to being like spelling errors. These are syntactical issues, and I had made the comment to you that the green squigglies felt like a grammar issue, but you had made a you, you said that was wrong headed because uh, you can extend this grammar. Right. In, um, in the, the wonderful squigglies that we're used to in, in Microsoft Word, both the, the red one for spelling mistakes and the green one for, for gram, grammatical errors, uh, d- are quite similar to, to what we provide in that the squigglies come up at design time. That is, as you're sitting there typing your program in, the, um, the squigglies appear and go away and, and, um, as you go along. The difference is that, that with our squigglies, when they, when they appear, 
uh, there are ways that you can suppress them. That is, they warn you about some condition. Uh, in, in Microsoft Word, if you've made a grammar mistake, um, you can fix it. But in some cases, the grammar checker is just not clever enough to, to do what you, what you wanted to do. And then, then you can just turn off the, the check. But in SpecSharp, you can do something better, which is that, that you can explain to it why this is correct. For example, um, if you, um, uh, if you use one of your parameters as an as an array index, perhaps inside your uh, inside of your method, and you get a complaint about it, um, then maybe the way to do it uh, to to tell the checker that you're still doing the right thing is to add a precondition to your method that says, "Well, this is not my responsibility; it's the responsibility of the caller to give me a good value." And then the the green squiggly will go away. Your code remains as as it is, but now you've made that contract explicit. Yeah, interesting. Fantastic. So people can go and download SpecSharp now. They can play with this now. They can instrument their code. Uh, you had mentioned that there were two different modes for this. There was a C Sharp mode and a Spec Sharp mode. Right. The um, the, the standard mode that uh, that we use in inside, for example, our program verifier itself, which is written in Spec Sharp. It's uh, maybe about sixty five thousand lines of Spec Sharp right now. Uh, is to use the the Spec Sharp mode in Visual Studio. Uh, unfortunately, that's that mode. Um, has some drawbacks because we have not put in all of the whizbang uh, functionality that you get in the in the C sh- visual um, C sharp uh, mode for um, um, in, in Visual Studio. Okay, that means that um, that you you get our, our additional uh, design time support in in that mode. Mm-hmm. But uh, for programmers who who either would like to to keep all of the the refactoring and all of the um, code formatting and features that, that are really nice to use in C Sharp. They can use, they can download Spec Sharp. Then in the properties tab, properties uh, pane of the, of the project, mm-hmm. we add a new contracts tab and one can turn on contracts. What happens then is when you then compile your C Sharp program, uh, you first run the C Sharp compiler and then immediately afterwards we run the Spec Sharp compiler. The Spec Sharp compiler then uh, would uh, produce the same result as the C sharp compiler, but um, but the spec sharp compiler is also going to peek into specially marked comments. So what you can do with a precondition is if you put it into a comment that begins with a caret sign, then it that's just a comment to the C sharp compiler, but the spec sharp compiler will will read it and understand it and generate code based on that. Now I'm realizing that some listeners who are, are a little more uh, familiar with these kind of concepts may think that this is a lot like some of the aspect-oriented compilers that have come out for C sharp, like X C sharp, where you could decorate C sharp with a uh, an attribute and say that I wish to insert tracing pre and post conditions. How is this different from those kind of aspect-oriented things? In many ways, it's quite similar. Uh, pre and post conditions, of course, can be thought of as aspects because they slice into a particular. Uh, well-defined join point. The difference with SpecSharp is that uh, the checking we do is something that goes, the static checking we do is something that goes far beyond what an aspect-oriented tool would be capable of. An aspect-oriented tool is capable of injecting code into the runtime for dynamic behavior. But our static verification relies upon a particular uh, uh, discipline of how you write your programs and use your fields in your objects uh, to guarantee their correctness and robustness against uh, future code evolution. And uh, so the, the surface syntax in that sense would be the same. It's like putting an attribute on a method. It's something that the C-sharp compiler ignores. But the value then is in the tools that we can apply to that code afterwards. I see. Okay. So I could see myself using an aspect-oriented type of a system in conjunction with SpecSharp, but other than that initial superficial similarity in that there are pre- and post-conditions, and these are, like as you said, the join points, uh, that's about where the similarity ends. And it's really about static verification of the correctness of, of, of your application. So presumably then I should be able to access that information and then generate documentation from it. Uh, yes, the, the the information is there, and one could extract it into into an, uh, a document that reads in English or with the with the formulas to to describe what what the documentation ought to say. So it's almost like Spec Sharp enforces my comments. Uh, yes, the um, it's a f- way to formalize your comments. That is, put them into something that is going to be read by the machine, and if you want to, then also checked by machine uh, by by the machine to make sure that they're up to date with the with the current program text. Very cool. I think that anything that allows the programmer to more explicitly and formally express their intent such that it is unambiguous and in a machine-readable format is definitely a really good thing. 
That's right. It's expressing in, intent is all about what contracts are about. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Rustin and Mike from the Microsoft Research Team. And again, the product is Spec Sharp, and you can download that. We'll have links up on the show site. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.